All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you having uh, energized conversations in the front, please uh, get seated. This is uh, promising to be a good session. Uh, thanks for those coming in. Thanks for making time. Mark, welcome. Uh, oh, thank thanks for being here. Um, this is a um, unique session in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is it's associated with the release of data. So I'm going to tell you right up front, we're going to be presenting data, there'll be analysis, and it's actually the first time that this analysis has been shared before. For those of you who are note takers um, or picture takers, please by all means do it, but just know that as of 9 a.m. this morning, there's a press release, and this data is actually now in the public domain, and you're free to take it, use it, and you know, throw it into your corporate presentations uh, wherever you want to use them, and I trust me, I think you're going to want to do so. Um, all good things start with a story, and I'll just say there is a story behind how this got started. Um, back in the spring, I was having a conversation with a not-to-be-named head of R&D at a not-to-be-named big pharma company about the work that we're doing at Tanaya Therapeutics. I'm CEO of Tanaya Therapeutics. We're focused on heart disease. And, um, and they were talking about, well, what's the probability? The question was kind of simple. Well, for us, what probability of technical success should I assign to these what look like really compelling gene therapy assets that you guys are working on for mm -hmm. genetic cardiomyopathies. And I was like, well, it's 100%. <laughs> it's all going to work. Of course. It's going to work. Didn't you hear anything we just presented to you? Like, well, it's going to be 100%. Well, but the question was serious. And uh, I was like, I can articulate the rate of success for cardiovascular disease, which is abysmal. If you look at the bio data, it's like, you know, 6%. I can articulate the rate of orphan diseases. But it can't really articulate the rate of success for gene therapies. I don't know if we have enough data for that. And so we turned around to my good friends at ARM, and, uh, and, then, the, and then they turned around and talked to Mark. And lo and behold, flash forward a few months later, they had an answer for me. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Up till now, mostly at the, uh, at the ARM meeting, we've talked about the success of the field in terms of the sheer number of studies, the amount of money, the amount of approvals, and that's all good. But I think today might be the first time that we're in a position to actually quantify how are we doing from a success rate perspective in clinical development and answer the question, are cell and gene therapies a good clinical bet? So with that, Mark, welcome. Um, and let's just start with, uh, maybe you can start telling us, uh, Mark, a little bit about NewDigs, the organization that you're representing. Sure, and we're gonna answer this question of uh, are cell and gene therapy programs a, a better bet by looking at uh, how likely they are to move from phase one to FDA approval uh, compared to other therapeutic mo modalities? And uh, for Oz, it gave me a nice softball question to give me a blatant self-promotion opportunity. So uh, let me do that for just a moment. Uh, so at New Digs, we're trying to help the system catch up with the science. And really, our mission is about a improving health outcomes by accelerating timely and appropriate patient access to new biomedical products, uh, mostly therapeutics, uh, but doing it in ways that work for all stakeholders. And we do this through multi-stakeholder uh, efforts, which include developers, that include payers, that include the patients, the physicians and providers, a few academics like myself, but also even investors through all of this. We've had a track record of about 14, 15 years now, began an accelerated approval in the regulatory process that led to the adaptive pathways process at the EMA that Bluebird Bio, who I know there's some people in the room, uh, were really pioneers in that work and their product was the first to go through that and achieved a regulatory approval in Europe about a year or two years sooner than here in the United States, really demonstrating the value of both uh, innovative regulatory models as well as, we thought, the New Digs process through all this. We then moved on to learning ecosystems, that was leaps and real world evidence, but we're gonna be talking mostly today about focus where we're dedicated to making these innovative cures accessible and sustainable. And yes, I know they're durable, only potentially curative therapies, but durable, potentially curative therapy makes a lousy acronym, so it's FOCUS uh, through all this. And since 2016, we've had you know, over 100, now nearly 150 organizations involved in our work, and uh, 400 to 500 individuals have participated in numerous work streams uh, through this whole process. And we pick up the story after price has been set. We knew 
that no matter how you did the analysis, durable cell and gene therapies were transformative and with their one-time payment approach, were gonna be transformatively priced, right? And whether you thought that number should be $100,000, $1 million, $10 million, it was gonna be big. And no one in the room ever had the answer to, then what? All right? And that's what we focused on is, after you've agreed on the price, and they're transformatively priced, as well as have transformative impact on patients, how, what do you do then? And we call that precision financing. And the first part of that effort, long ago, was to say, are we talking about a half a trillion dollars worth of impact, or are we talking about something less? And so we built something called the pipeline analysis model, where we took the existing pipeline of durable cell and gene therapies and rolled it forward until that pipeline, uh, in essence, was exhausted, that they'd all reached completion. It took about 10 years uh, worth of you know, looking forward in, in the projection. And part of that model required success rates, of course. Right? So we did a huge analysis of all the clinicaltrials.gov reported trials and all the programs in cell and gene therapies from 1988 all the way through uh, what we're now up to 2020. Um, and we said, well, what are those success rates? And rolled them forward. Thanks to your investor who asked you a question that you wanted an answer to, and Tim's reaching out to us, they said, well, you have all those success rates in the background, right? So could you like compare them to other drugs? And we said, well, yeah, that's a great idea. We should have thought of that a long time ago. Thank you for prompting us to, uh, to, to pull this out. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So then the question was, well, what do we compare it to? And there's lots of different approaches out there, right? So bio and IQVIA uh, are the sources that we went to. The little red bars mean that bio breaks it out by therapeutic area. IQVIA just gave us total numbers. Uh, but there's also some of my friends at Tufts from Joe DeMacy and my friends of uh, Dr. Wong and Dr. Lowe at MIT who've also done these analyses. But they're getting a little long in the tooth right now. They stopped their analysis of 2015 and 2009, and we know this is a fast-moving field. All drug development is. So we took the bio and the IQVIA data to, to compare to through all this. So we started looking at the CAR-Ts through all this. And so let me show you a top-line result. So how do they compare to the average oncology drug in bio? And the answer was, oh my gosh, they're like double the chance of success going from phase one all the way through uh, approval by the FDA. We said, no, that can't be right. How is that possible? Then I had to remember, oh yeah, compounding. It makes a difference, right? So all these success rates that you see below in the, in the verticals, you know, they're 10 percentage points higher here, five percentage points higher there. But when you multiply out those change from phase one all the way through regulatory approval, the hematological CAR-Ts get a 17.2% chance of gaining approval once they enter the clinic, compared to only 5% for your average oncology drug. And then smart people said, yeah, but these are practically all in hematology, so can you compare it to the hematology uh, cancer drugs? Just to be more fair, right? Because solid tumors are different and a little tougher. So we said, sure, let's take a look at that. And the answers come out, well, you know, if you're in the hematology space looking at the normal things, so, well, our numbers went up 50% from 5.3 to 7.5, and we said that was great. We're still double. The CAR-Ts have double the chance of achieving FDA approval than your normal hematological cancer drug, right, based on the bio -grade. And that's across every uh, uh, phase except for phase one. And you'll see here that CAR-Ts over this period have uh, uh, a lower success rate, 17% less, 9 percentage points less uh, than other oncology drugs. And we, that's just what we found. And we promise uh, for uh, the audience to have a chance to ask some questions later, so start getting them um, ready now. And I would say let's throw it out to the oncologists or the oncology companies in the audience to speculate 
why would it be at phase one, that's the only phase where um, CAR-Ts and TCRs uh, do not outperform traditional modalities, and hopefully some of you will have a clever, not only clever questions, but answer to that quiz, but please. Yeah. So I can make the observation, hopefully you have the insights, mm -hmm. right, as to what were the causes behind that observation. So then we turn to what we call orphan gene therapies. Think of it as all the non-oncology durable cell and gene therapies. And so there, we first compared it to the bioestimates like we had done in the oncology. And there we came out an astonishing three and a half times higher than the average medicine across all the modalities in the biodatabase. And again, with the same kind of analysis, you'll see here, it's 10 points higher here, five points there, it's 10%, 30% higher in phase three, 65% higher in phase two, 48% higher in phase one. You add it all up, uh, it's a 28% chance of approval for durable cell and gene therapies versus 8% for your whatever drug candidate therapy across all therapeutic areas and indications. But they're not the only source, so we looked at the IQVIA data. And the IQVIA data, uh, instead of an 8% that bio showed, they thought it was a 13% chance going forward. Uh, so cell and gene therapies are a mere two times better through all this. It's just an astonishing com comparison, at least to me. I didn't think it was going to come out quite this uh, uh, strong through all that. I mean, just uh, and just to put it in perspective, how many, you know, we, we how, how much data do we now have? How many programs are we talking about that are in the, whether it's in the CAR TTCR side or the orphan gene therapy side? Because, you know, is it a law of small numbers or really talking about robust data sets now? They're robust enough, right? So they're not tens of thousands, right? But there are in the hundreds to low thousands of trials and programs through all this. So we all know that at the final step of NDA, BLA approval, we're a dozen or two, right? It's almost statistically numerous. You know, you get up to 20 or 25, and we can claim law of large numbers come in, right? But all the others have hundreds of trials and programs that go into those averages. Now, for the total drug pipeline, you're talking tens of thousands, right? But we're talking the average here. So you can argue maybe there's better ranges on this, but I would point out you'll see no error bars on this, right? It's not a statistical fluke. We did an inventory. We looked at every bloody trial, right? So there aren't error bars. These aren't estimates. These are what has happened. These are the facts, right, complete. Now, historical numbers may not project all the cool new stuff you guys are doing going forward, right, because the new modalities may not exactly look like the old modalities, but this is complete. This is every trial and program that we can see that has completed and then either been officially terminated or moved forward, everyone is in this analysis. So this includes AEV, ADNO, ex vivo lenti, this pretty much all the things that we Every consider. technology, yep. we did look at every one of the regimens and it had to be a single dose, single administration mm -hmm. therapy. So if they were multiply dosed mRNA therapies or some of the others, those were not included in this. Yeah. And, and one maybe point of clarification, I see NDA, BLA, so is it fair to conclude that this data set and this comparison is all focused on U.S. approvals? It doesn't even include the approvals that happen in the EMA in this period. Correct. This was a U.S.-focused uh, exercise. And that was partially because clinicaltrials.gov, which was our data source for this, uh, if you're going to submit something to the FDA, you're supposed to report that data, or your program is anticipating being for the U.S. market, it's supposed to be in that database. Uh, and we also find uh, that's where more of the serious science goes on, so that also helped us get rid of uh, some of the dilettante trials that you might think of that are someone just sort of playing around in some other country or some academic just doing something that wasn't really serious. But if you're going to get published, if you're going to submit something to the FDA, it goes in clinicaltrials.gov. So we think of it as the, uh, the promising and active pipeline as opposed to all the dilettante trials. I mean, these data are outstanding, and I'm just curious, going into this, um, were you, was this what you were expecting? Were you surprised when you saw this data? Well, I must admit it was with a lot of caveats when Tim and ARM uh, came forward. We said, well, we're going to pull out the data, 
but I can't guarantee it's going to be a number you're going to want me on the stage at ARM meeting on the Mesa to talk about, right? But we'll tell you what the numbers are, and I thought it was likely to be equal to better. I didn't expect it to be double. And I'm a finance health economist guy. I should know about compounding, right? Uh, but this really shows after every step being better and significantly better at each step, it really adds up for the entire program. And it's probably worth pausing and emphasizing that this is really your database and um, there's a certain amount of independence and objectivity that comes from the work and the exercise that you're doing here. Of course, ARM and Nudix collaborated to put this out, but the work and the data sets are completely independently done. Yeah, we had built this database over five or six years for that portfolio pipeline analysis model uh, work that we had talked about. So this was really you guys coming to us and say, can you pull that, that data out and really do this comparison uh, analysis? But uh, no, we didn't actually uh, generate new data or try to spin the data in any way, which is why I gave you a lot of caveats before we started, because the data was going to be what the data is. Um, it's just um, uh, fairly dramatic. Well, there's one more to go. There is, if I can get my button to work. So the slide we just went was comparing it to all candidate therapeutics, but we thought that wasn't quite fair because cell and gene therapies tend to be concentrated in certain therapeutic areas. And we know success rates vary by therapeutic areas. So they're mostly in hematology, metabolic diseases, neurology, ophthalmology, um, as well as some autoimmune. So we took the bio data for those therapeutic areas and combined it straight averages, good statisticians, we didn't know their counts, we didn't know how to weight it, so we just took straight averages across it all, and again compared, whoops, and the headline number is you're still double, right? It had been like three and a half times, right? So when you compare therapeutic area to therapeutic area, it's still double the uh, likelihood of approval once you enter phase one. And also, just as a reminder, right, this is a cutoff for all this analysis was, you said, 2020? Correct. And I, for those of you who might have been here on day one when Tim presented, we went from a period of time when there were five approvals in six years to potentially five approvals this year alone, or eight approvals this year alone. So this isn't even capturing the recent successes that we've had in the last couple of years. Um, granted, it also doesn't capture recent failures, uh, but, but uh, I, I, I have to imagine that you're going to update this analysis, uh, you know, at some point. To, well, to I would hope to be here next year, for example, <laughs> giving you some updated yeah. numbers yeah. Uh, for all of this uh, yeah. go going forward. Uh, so just to really put a pin on it here at the end, you know, are they a good bet? The answer appears to be from a technical and regulatory success approach, right, and looking at this, they are a phenomenal clinical bet going forward. That durable cell and gene therapies for rare and orphan conditions and the CAR-Ts for hematologicals have higher success rates once they enter the program, and that is whether you look, compare them to all therapeutic programs, therapeutic programs in the same therapeutic area, and even with the exception of phase one for CAR-Ts, every development phase uh, they perform uh, with higher success than your average drug or your other modality drug. And I would point out that those other averages that we saw from IQVIA and Bio, they included the durable cell and gene therapies and we didn't know how to back them out of the number. So their numbers are all goosed upwards by having the cell and gene therapies in them. Right. So if you excluded the cell and gene therapies, there's a chance that the numbers would look even more dramatic, right. maybe marginally so, because the data sets are small for the cell and gene therapy side. Yeah, so probably in the total averages, it may not make that much difference, but the point is Bio and IQVIA were both quite specific that they included all the cell and gene therapies in their average numbers, mm -hmm. uh, which should have dragged their numbers higher. Uh, so it's a very conservative comparison. So we promised that there would uh, be a chance for the audience to make comment or ask questions. So please, I uh, will ask uh, you to raise your hand if you'd like to ask one. And um, uh, while the mics are making their way around, um, I'll just say, you know, this is outstanding. This is really 
was so exciting to see. It has nothing to do with the fact the numbers came out well. It's no, 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 no. The, I would have said the same thing if it were work. terrible. I would have said, like, my God, this is amazing. You know, yeah, it was great, we suck. Great, great uh, analysis. No, yeah. no, Thank honestly, you like, uh, you know, our field, uh, how do we measure the success of all the great work that's happening in this room? And um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and we talk about approvals uh, of new products getting uh, to patients, that's great, and that's uh, super exciting. Tim talked about that on day one. Um, we've talked about money coming to the field, and well, that's not been quite the same over the last year or two. It's been a tough period. Um, we talk about patient impact, and uh, we started this meeting with a video, and we just had a panel before this about patients, um, and there's so many different ways. I love that we have a new um, set of analyses to show the, the promise of all the work that you're doing. That when you get started on an endeavor, which is tough, the likelihood of success is it's not 100%, but it's significantly higher than with other modalities. And for those of us who are fighting the good fight every day, you know, keep fighting that good fight because there's a, at least a 28 to 30 percent chance that that will you know, pan out and lead to an approval. And if you think about that way, I talk to investors, I talk to um, pharma uh, uh, all the time, and when they model things, they're often using the bio or IQVIA success rates to model things, to value programs, to value right. you know, um, how much this would be, or the investors are using the models. I think this is the first time we have something that can offer an alternative. I know I'll be taking those slides and I'll be sending them over to that head of R&D at a nameless big pharma company saying like, I have the answer to your question five months later. So I think And for a those of you looking for an exit, just make sure that the pharma counterparty is using these probabilities of technical and regulatory yeah. success, not and the standard right. industry yeah, ones. Exactly. Right? So I, th I think there's a question there in the audience. Hey, um, this is uh, Eric Faulkner. So first of all, first of all, uh, this is great. You know, if you've worked in this space for a long time, then there are a few things that make you more excited than seeing data like this. Uh, it's spectacular. So the question that I would have is given this kind of outcome, in the last couple of years we've seen a little bit more trepidation on the big pharma side for how to wade in and play in this space. You know, there, there are experimentation, other stuff going on. What do you think would be the message there uh, from this to, to the larger organizations that are entering this field and you know, playing different levels of, of working with the small biotechs to help make this happen? Ooh, what do we message? I mean, I think uh, I'll offer a, a point of view and mm -hmm. maybe you'll add to that because we, we, we um, I think the headlines have been dominated, unfortunately, in the last couple of years in some ways by either sticker shock on price or you know, dose limiting toxicities. And, um, and, and so there's, uh, you know, does that influence investors? Possibly, right? But we need to be looking at approvals and we need to be looking at success rates. And so I would, I would really encourage investors and, and people who may have been down on the field a little bit um, to, even if it's just a temporary blip, to look at numbers like this and say, if you're, if you're betting your investment dollars, this is a really good bet, right? And maybe there's, we've learned as a field a lot about what works, we've learned a lot about how things can go sideways, and we have corrected that. We have fixed many of those things. We've made adjustments, and that is, you know, that hasn't stopped the programs from moving forward and transitioning from phase one to two to three and eventual approvals. So um, I would just offer this as a counterpoint to any negativity that somebody might have about um, the overall success of the field and productivity of the field. So I think there's a lot of education to do in the space still. Yeah. I know there's another question here. Yeah, not a question, but you had asked for a potential rationale to yeah. understand the data. Thank you. So I thought maybe I'd focus on the, the CAR-T and hematological so malignancies as someone who spent a couple decades uh, working on uh, cell therapy for cancer. Uh, it seems to me that part of the rationale, particularly the disconnect between the phase one and later phases, is that for drug development overall, but particularly for cell therapies, the bar for phase one is much higher than it used to be. It's not about safety, right? You have to have, given the cost and the logistics involved for patients, the you know, internally we and investors set the bar very high, right? So uh, I think that unless you're seeing deep, durable responses in that phase one, 
uh, you're not going to move that drug forward. If you do see that, like I remember when I joined Juno, it was a single image of a patient that lit up like a Christmas tree with lymphoma that disappeared, you know, with a tiny little number of cells in the bottom of an epidorph having been the therapeutic, like, that was convincing. That was going to be an approvable drug, right? We just needed to demonstrate it, right? And so if you're seeing those type of responses in a phase one, the likelihood that you'll succeed in phase two in a pivotal trial is highly likely, right? And so I think that's, from my perspective, why you're seeing those numbers. Well, that's a much more compelling uh, response than my guess, which was because we went back to 1988, we picked up some of the early failures within that uh, space. That's a much better answer, so thank you. I also like that, and I think there's a question in front here, and there's a mic coming over to them. I also just, you know, for those of you who are in phase one oncology, and if your initial result doesn't look as great as you hoped, hopefully these numbers will tell you don't lose hope too quickly. You know, maybe maybe you deserve another shot uh, on, on, on goal here. Spoken as a true entrepreneur. There you go. <laughs> don't give up fast. I think longitudinally following this data will be helpful. I think about... 40% of the CAR Ts that are in development in the hematological space are uh, addressing CD19. And um, I think that that dynamic is uh, perhaps going to slow uh, the rate of success there just because the initial products um, are being very successful um, in yes. the CD19 patient population. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see how additional layers of maturity of development, mm -hmm. um, you know, impact your data. Absolutely, and maintaining 100% NDA BLA approval and 100% phase three as we go into BCM, uh, BCBMA uh, secondary targets uh, and others. We'll see how it plays out. I would say that in at least the phase twos and the phase ones, all those early programs have mostly passed that stage, so we have less success bias, uh, which is what you're bringing up. There may be success bias on a particularly successful single target. Well, I'm, I'm actually suggesting it's going to really taper off because even accessing CD19 patients now is much more challenging for all of those registered trials that are mm -hmm. in play, so you probably see them really slowing up. Yeah, so we didn't look at time and phase partially for, for that reason. These are just the success. So when they complete, did they have a successful result? Your point's about dragging out the timeline and whether there's uh, oversaturation of a particular yes. target, yes. right? Are other investor considerations that this analysis doesn't yeah. address? For, th for this trend to continue, there needs to be new targets, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Don't disagree. Sort of following up on Allison's um, comment, are there, do you have theories about whether or not there's any um, explanation related to like this being early days in cell and gene, like anything that would correlate it being relatively early in the field with a higher success rate than, you know, the, the, the full? Yeah, so lots of theories, little evidence. Um, one reason I was so hesitant to do this analysis in the first place is these are all new therapeutic modalities, which generally have a lot of failure at the beginning as you try to work out the technology, right? Any new technology tends to fail more. So I was uh, concerned that while we knew we had good success at the top end of the pipeline, I was a little concerned at the phase one, phase two level because there was a lot of experimentation on new of approaches, and I wasn't sure those numbers would hold up, right? But they're actually higher in most, right? Which really surprised me uh, through all this. So I think it's, it's the opposite side. I would have expected lower phase ones and phase twos as the new technology stumbled, right? And you had to try four different ways and which vector was really gonna work and all these sorts of things. And it's still better, despite all that huge technological risk at the beginning of entirely new modalities. And it's still higher, which makes me think if you stayed with those modalities, it would uh, get even better. But as we've heard, there's a lot of new technologies and new modalities coming forward, but it gives me hope that they too will perform better because the historic early ones have performed better. I mean, I'll, uh, I think it's an important observation that both Allison and Janet are making. I'd say one thing, certainly I 
the, it intuitively makes sense that on the orphan gene therapy side, where it's, we're talking about lock and key mechanisms, you understand the genetic defect, you're intervening with a genetic solution, that's what's, you know, it intuitively kind of makes sense that some of these numbers are higher. And, and maybe I think when we talk about these being new, maybe a slightly different spin on that is that, well, at least if you take AAVs, they're not new. AAVs, we're on version two of AAVs, right? We're, there were scores of studies back in the day, maybe even hundreds using AV1 or two, and those failed, right? And we're not talking about that stuff from like the 80s and the 90s or Jesse Gelsinger. We're, the, 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 the people in the audience today are working on the next generation of capsids, working on um, and maybe going after some of the same targets, maybe different targets. We've learned a lot about manufacturing. We've learned about so many things. And I'm, I, I want to believe that some of that is reflected in some of the success that's been captured, um, not maybe going all the way back to the 80s, but capturing you know, the next generation of, uh, of efforts uh, that have benefited from the learnings of the previous efforts. So I'd like to believe that we're entering the golden age. Time will tell, Allison, whether that lands out. But this is, um, this is a, I think, a much needed uh, boost of positivity uh, at a time when there's so many work, people working on so many um, promising technologies. And so thank you, Mark, for um, conducting this analysis. I want to thank particularly the ARM staff and Stephen Majors in particular for um, helping shepherd this and working with you on it and getting the, the data out there. It's available to all of you. You can use this. Use it with your investors. Use it with your boards. Use it in your presentations to you know, those big pharma collaborators that you're trying to reel in. Uh, this is important data. And, um, and I don't think there are any more questions in the audience. And even if they were, take them offline. Find Mark. He's going to be here until. I'll be here all afternoon. Uh, he's going to be here all afternoon. But out of respect for the next session, uh, please join me in giving a round of applause to uh, Mark. Thank you all. Glad to be with you today.